Welcome to the Hiring on All Cylinders podcast. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Kelly Cartwright, Vice President of Global Talent Acquisition at Splunk. Kelly has built one of the most incredible and diverse careers, spanning across world-leading companies and across various disciplines. She has held leadership roles in marketing, business development, operations, and corporate development, as well as holding general manager and CEO roles. Super interesting, and I can't wait to get the conversation started. Welcome, Kelly. How are you? Thanks, Chris. I'm great. Looking forward to having a good discussion today. Awesome. Um, so you know, I mentioned in the intro, you've had a really interesting career. And you know, from the outside, it seems like you've worked in some very different positions. Can you talk a little bit about you know, your tra- trajectory, how you've made those jumps? And has there been a common link that's allowed you to you know, build such diverse set of experience? Um, interesting question. I, I think, like many people, when I talk to individuals about, well, how is it that you got into talent acquisition or recruiting? Um, so many of those stories were they sort of fell into it versus being super purposeful, like coming out of either different jobs or maybe out of um, out of college. And the, I had a very similar experience in that um, I have a general like liberal arts degree and background. I've actually have a degree in art history and studio art. And um, I was spending the summer thinking about, you know, I was going to go pursue my master's and decided not to. And, you know, I was oddly I was working at um, I was working at a country club teaching tennis. <laughs> um, I was I'm a former. Nice. Uh, yeah, I was a, t- a, t- a tennis player and um, became friendly with one of the members who owned a regional staffing firm. And they had approached me and said, hey, we're looking for a sales rep to come in and, you know, work for our business and, and selling staffing services. And I really didn't know much about it. And long story short, I met with them, ended up interviewing with them. And um, that's how I actually how I started my journey in this business and space. Um, so that's how I got into it. But in terms of the navigation, I did start off um, on the staffing services side of the house, selling professional services, getting exposure to recruitment. And as I navigated that, um, you know, I, I, I had the opportunity early on, and I really thank um, a leader that I worked for for a number of years. His name's Bill Sebra. He's still in the industry. Um, but I worked to work for an early stage RPO. And at that company, through a, a span of five years, because they were an early sort of growth phase, I had the, the opportunity was presented to me to work in a variety of different roles at that organization. So I started out as a recruiter and managing projects and working with customers Mm -hmm. and then transitioned into actually selling the services and being out in front of customers and hearing what their issues were around recruiting and challenges. And most times when a company is calling an RPO, now it might be a little bit more strategic because the outsourcing industry in our space has matured greatly over when I first started. This was like in late to mid 90s. But just hearing, you know, that we usually when we got called in, it was hair on fire. I'm behind in my hiring. Like, how is it? Do I accelerate it? Come and help me. And just hearing about like the challenges and how they were set up and learning um, and, and meeting with all these different companies through that sales process to then figuring out we were really small. If I was going to continue to sell successful engagements and either have fall one work or referenceable customers we couldn't just go out and plop a bunch of recruiters into an environment and, and hope and pray that they delivered the way that we wanted to. So I then got involved operationally with how is that we think through from the time that we sell our products and services, like how do we build something that's productized and scalable? And so you're really architecting out the product of recruiting delivery. So from the time that you are understanding a company and what you need and how you would go out and sell and present that organization through how the actual delivery experience is that the customer um, would have. Um, So like really building the process, the methodology, the tools, the enablement, how you measure, how you would go in and actually, um, you know, write proposals that say what we're going to do and how we were going to show up and do it was an incredible journey Mm -hmm. for me. So I was able to be an individual contributor to going into sales role to actually architecting out how we started delivering services at scale. So I I credit a lot of my early experience to that because 
it definitely set me in a different frame of mind when I was thinking about recruiting, recruiting as a function, talent acquisition, and how to build and scale services. That's really cool. And you said you started a, a, like a startup RPO, and then you later, I think one of your companies got acquired or you moved into a larger enterprise RPO. Did you find that an easy transition or what did you see as the, the biggest differences from moving you know, from kind of startup scale up into enterprise? Um, I, I would say that, yes, I, in this early stage startup, we went from having, you know, a, a, something of 20 recruiters to 100 recruiters and building sort of that top line revenue and, and something that's scalable. I mean, I, I did go through a different couple of different stops before I ended up working at a larger scale um, enterprise RPO. Yeah. So I, I actually did end up working at a technology vendor. So that was an interesting stop for along the way because... You know, I, I, I went there to help them sort of build out um, their strategy for a referral product, an employer referral product um, that they were building. And so I got a lot of exposure at that point in my career to more product management, um, leading technical teams, et cetera. And it was back in, you know, the early late 90s, 2000s. And guess what? It was a funded, you know, VC funded our uh, startup that ended up. You know, we had to end up t- selling the technology assets, which, you know, again, I was very blessed in that. Unfortunately for me, I had to be in a position where I had to um, lay off um, all the employees that were there to a very small subset. So the CEO was exited and I ended up being in that position where they I was the person on that executive team at that company um, to be asked to be the acting CEO as we sold the technology assets, which we ended up selling to Manpower Professional. So another staffing firm. Um, So that was a really interesting journey because again, like while it was all around how it is that you build an architect and deliver services that were TA related or recruiting related to customers, um, I'm just wearing a different business hat. Um, So having the responsibility of thinking about P&Ls and OPEX and those kinds of things. So that was a really interesting part of my journey was to go there. Um, And that was like a stop off along the way in my journey that um, really while interesting and where where there's some painful experiences, but making the decisions of, you know, when you're going to pull back or when it is that you're strategically going to say, I don't think we can ever make our top line revenue and therefore we're going to recommend Um, to the board and the VCs that we should sell the technology assets versus continuing to just make a go at it um, was a really interesting experience early in my career. It seems it's so interesting. I think for a lot of people in talent and recruiting, it seems like a massive jump from, you know, doing what most people are doing to then going and selling products and services, you know, architecting that process, managing technical teams and, um, did those opportunities, you mentioned you had a great leader who you know, opened up some of those opportunities for you, but were you actively kind of seeking those different opportunities out or did they just you know, present themselves through this natural, um, you know, I guess, path that you were following? Um, yeah, that, I'm just really interested in how you move from one to the other. I think um, in, in the, I, I think that Like one of my superpowers over time, and I've discovered it through my own self journey, but also, you know, taking multitude of assessments, whether it's Gallup or other things like that. But um, I do have the knack of if there's a puzzle that needs to be put together and there's a lot of pieces, I can very quickly see how those pieces and parts fit together um, and sort of see the end state, you know, vision that we're trying to or the solve that we're trying to get to. I think in those environments, I was like always really dissatisfied a little bit with the status quo, like we could be better or we could be moving ahead or how would we problem solve? And so I either would, you know, raise my hand to do the hard task and say, I'll help, I'll jump in and do it. Um, But I also was one to raise, you know, kind of pushing the status quo and thinking about what we should be doing differently. So I think it was a little bit of both, Um, but Mm -hmm. it was definitely like, you know, I was leaning in and taking risks and being prepared to, you know, maybe work in a a little bit of a stressful, time compressed environment um, because it was where where's the fire today, um, or what's the problem yeah. du jour? And I was always willing to to raise my hand to go and work in that, which 
it didn't always work, but the experience that I got volunteering to be in those sort of firefighter modes um, was again, like a, a really good to my overall learning journey. And then having the leaders who were willing to lean in and, and take the risk um, because in, in many of those cases, I may have been like, it, would, it might've been like my first time at my first at bat with some of those roles, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's really cool. And you know, having all of that diverse experience, how has that influenced, you know, now you're in you know, TA leadership, how do you think that's influenced the work that you do now? Is there I, anything that kind of stands out? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I think for, for me, it's my ability to be able to, to, to show up with a business and have dialogue with business leaders or with, you know, an executive team and really understand the business, the business problems and be able to translate what it is that we are trying to do from a TA perspective and how to solve for those. Because it's not, it's, yes, our reason for being as a TA function is to make sure that we are delivering to the, the scope, like whatever the business headcount target and plan is. But the unit, we all know that there's so much more that goes into the function. Um, like, you know, we're always pulling the lever, lever of, is it how fast can we do it? So speed, cost, efficiency, diversity, experience, um, you know, how do we build a function? How do we make it scalable? How do we make it repeatable? And how is that experience one that's world class? Um, to the customers who deliver, like they're experiencing it to the stakeholders um, that are using, you know, the the actual quote unquote services and the candidates that are working in those processes. So I think I'm bringing, um, I, I, the, the way I talk about myself is that I feel like a, I'm a business executive that happens to have like extreme domain knowledge and expertise in talent acquisition. So I think, you know, my ability and my, 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 I feel very fortunate to have had the experience that I've had working in these different roles um, where I'm a business leader first and a town acquisition leader second. Mm -hmm. How do you think that, that shows up in, um, you know, how you make decisions, how you work and lead town acquisition? Do you think there's a, a difference between being the other way around, being TA first, business second? I mean, I think, you know, I, I, it's kind of cliche, but I mean, I'm definitely a, I'm a leader that's um, data driven. I'm going to influence decision making by using, you know, data. I'm going to, you know, look to see, you know, I need to like to, to figure out what my point of view is and what it is that I'm doing with a particular function is I've got to go in to seek to understand like what, what's the current state of the function. And is that through a cost lens? Is that through efficiency lens? Is that through like just general delivery results? Are we getting done? Like what it is that we were supposed to be getting done in the first place? And then, you know, really mapping out and having, you know, how do you set priorities for a function? Like how is it beyond just delivering, again, you know, the headcount that the business needs? Um, what does that multi-year journey look like? And what is it that you're trying to build the organization to look like in future state? You know, so I take a, you know, a very, I do almost, I, I almost take like a product management approach, which is I'm building out a multi-year roadmap and I'm looking at like cost implications, the ability to deliver and how quickly and what the impact will be of doing those things. Um, I think the other thing that's super important for TA leaders is all TA leaders are faced with, there's always a little element of flying the airplane while, you know, fixing it while you're flying it. And you know, understanding how much change the organization is able and willing to digest in and over what time period. And not just the TA organization, but the business and the hiring organization. Um, you know, trying to deploy a new ATS or I'm going to implement a CRM or I want to roll out a new assessment program. While those things on paper seem to be very rudimentary, fundamental things that we do in TA, um, you know, don't underestimate the amount of time, energy and effort it takes to bring people along on the journey and to, you know, change the behaviorals. And sometimes it's a cultural shift, too, and how people want to operate and work together. So that's interesting. Do you. Is it kind of case by case in terms of like the capacity of the business at that time, the size of the business, the complexity, 
is it you've got kind of a general rule that's you know no more than once a quarter we do an implementation or something like that how how do you um i guess take those things into consideration what do you look at when you're looking at that change limit i mean i don't know there's a i don't know that there's like a perfectly thought out matrix like here's the playbook <laughs> for me for how you look at that but because each 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 like each scenario can be a little different but it could be you got to look at the business environment and conditions and so and the timing too like do i want to like very like from a very basic level am i trying to roll out a lot of change within like for example a large go to market sales or an organization when it's at the end of quarter probably not mm -hmm. so there's things yeah. around time there's also um are we in a situation where like we're behind and like the hiring velocity is massive and we're just every day expending a ton of energy just to get it done it's really hard to put more pressure into a system that already is under a lot of pressure so sometimes you just have to look at timing and window and also make hard decisions, which is, okay, for my work back plan, it looks like I'm going to be able to roll out this, you know, solution. I want to get it into the calendar year and like December, like December, like December can be a great time or a terrible time because it's hiring slowing mm -hmm. down. It's our business like able to do it is like our, meaning our TA function is the business, you know, from a timing perspective, is that a good time or are people going to be checked out on vacation? So like, these are really simple things, but you have to look at, you know, what's going on in the business and also not just our own roadmap. So you have to look at in its entirety from like from an HR human capital people organization, what's the collective roadmap and what else is the business going to be asked to do in terms of training, change management, in term, terms of, like they've got their day jobs, but what else in the, in the system are they being asked to do and making sure that you're not working like this is just what I'm doing in my function, but what's happening across that's going to impact not only my own team members, um, but the other sort of end users um, that we're asking to either do work or or change some sort of behavior. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you see that a lot where you know this when especially when organizations become big, you know, siloed, people don't know what everyone else is doing or you know, how they're going to be impacted by change, implementation, and, and how their time is going to get sucked up. Um, and everyone just frantically running around doing a little of a, a lot of a little, yeah, a little of a lot, whichever way around it is. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you um, was just talking about is how important it is to be kind of a business leader, be in the business and not just in TA. I think, you know, some of the times TA leaders find themselves, you know, just in this frantic situation where they're trying to hit the headcount goal. They've got a ton of pressure on them and their teams to just get those numbers in, like you were saying, especially over the last 18 months, you know, post-COVID, it's been pretty crazy. What recommendations would you give to, you know, talent leaders that want to take that step in and become more well-rounded um, as a business leader? Um but at the moment, they they feel very kind of constrained in, in TA. Is there any kind of small steps or things that they can do inside the organization that you'd recommend? I mean, the, some of the things that I just heard you mentioned were um, getting headcount. Like, I did, I, yeah. did I hear you say that? Like, TA is always in this basic struggle of, I'm just trying to understand what the business wants, right? Because our like for us, for the TA function to be enabled, to actually have an enterprise TA strategy, there's a little bit of the maturity on the business side that needs to be there. And I'm not talking about sophisticated workforce planning. We could just talk about rudimentary headcount planning and the cycle of business. And that never mm -hmm. seems no matter how, and, and I've worked in a lot of different companies, um, even the like, exposure to the, a lot of companies, big name companies in the fortune 200. And like, nah, there always seems to be like a gas on gas off thing that we go through in our function. But I'm just going to go back to like, data like you know they want to understand well why do you need this much headcount or how productive is your organization and, and why does it look like that i think you, you've got to have like a i'm not saying that the individual leader needs to do it but having people on your team that have the capability um to do forecasting and scenario modeling and understanding you know what is your current productivity and what does it take to actually deliver to the organization so you can make the business case um, to actually show what is needed to deliver. So I'm going to like, answer that kind of por por um, yeah, yeah. portion of the question from, from that perspective. So I think that's really 
important because so many times I don't think that we're equipped with the information that we need from a data perspective to readily influence. And I can, I can tell you even just on my own journey here, sometimes the data isn't there um, either through mm-hmm. systems deployment workflow, like, Oh, I don't have trends data because I don't even like, I, we don't even have the ability to do it. You have to start from the very basic. So my recommendation always is start with what it is that you think that you want to have from like a KPI or metrics framework and how you're going to operationally manage your business, like how you manage and run your own business and then how it is that you are going to um, talk about that with the business. Like what are the key data points and why that you're going to bring to them and then work back on how to recreate that. And sometimes if it has to be manual, manual is better than nothing, which I know is painful, but I think that that helps to establish like the credibility with the business is just being read in. But I think in terms of, well, where could I go potentially as a TA professional, especially maybe if I've started as a recruiter and I've grown into being a people manager and my scope and remit continues to um, expand, I would say, like, seek out a mentor in the current business environment that you're in that is a finance leader and work with them to get their perspective and what would they look for and getting some basic like whether it's understanding your general ledger or your OPEX or those things, like I would, you know, seek out over time having a mentor that's from finance, having a mentor that is from products or because from, from a product management perspective, we really are building a set of services that can be productized that we want to continue to scale. And, and how if you take a product management mindset and work back from the customer um, to architect out how it is that you're going to deliver services. I think that's also a recommendation because you can you can learn a lot. They can reference materials, books, training, um, other things. I don't think that necessarily, and no knock on SHRM or anything else, I don't know that going to, to continue to work on you know TA or get my certifications is necessarily going to round us out as TA leaders um, from you know having other like being strong in other areas of the business. So that would be my recommendation. Yeah, that's really interesting. I really like the idea of finding a mentor in a, a kind of a business function like finance. I can imagine how that would be really useful. Um, and, you know, I guess the, one of the things from your, your background that you've been heavily involved in is you know, building you know, strategies and programs of work, you know, transformation programs in organizations. And I think in TA, there's always a lot of talk about you know, strategy and um, very rarely do you see it executed to dwell. Is there kind of you know, any key mistakes that you think people make when they're building strategies um, and, um, and you know, fail to execute on them properly? Um, I do believe it all goes into how much thoughtfulness is put into planning. So, and what I mean by that is you can have a group of leaders. I could, I could, you know, you, you look at the business strategy and you're like, okay, well, this is our overall business strategy that we're going to map our TA function to. So what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And again, it's like, you know, rudimentary it could be, you know, delivering headcount. Um, but are we trying to be more efficient? Are we trying to be faster? Are we trying to be, you know, more cost, cost effective? Are we going to try to impact experience, et cetera? And, you can come up with a plan. Like I want to over X amount of time um, increase my productivity or I want to take my cost of hire down from X to Y. And you can aspirationally have those things, but then you have to get very specific about what are the actual things that we are going to do that are going to impact that. And in what level of impact do we think that we would have and I think it, one of the things I, oh, it brings me to another point. The other high recommendation is all around project management. Um, because I think, you know, having that program and project management capability and discipline is critical because the ability to take a strategy and translate that into a plan that has actual components of what it is that you are trying to accomplish over X period of time. You have to have single threaded leaders for those particular projects or initiatives. There needs to be 
it needs to be time bound. Like what is it that we think we're going to accomplish by when, what is the business impact that we're looking to deliver? That's measurable. So it's a, you have a project, you have the impact, you are able to measure and you have to have a routine in which you inspect progress. So, so many times I see, I see aspirational things that are like, we're going to try to do X and that's what they've put in their plan. And there is nothing tied to watching progress, measuring progress. And who is it that you are holding accountable for making that needle move? So you, you have to have people that own it and you have to have a space in which leaders can come together to really inspect the, the progress against those things. So, you know, it, it goes a little bit back to some of the learnings that I had at my formal, former employee at Amazon. But the concept of actually having people that own something, I've seen the mistake of, well, Sue and Mary and Jane are working on this project. I was like, well, at the end of the day. Who is accountable for whether the project is on time or it fails or is it is a success? So then that person owns it. They're accountable for it. It's part of their goals. And that's how you drive activity. And as you come together and you look at why is it on time, then you can have a discussion about, well, what are the blockers or, you know, how is it that we can remove those things to keep, you know, progress moving forward? So it's taking that strategy and articulating that into a like into a clear plan with projects, deliverables, milestones, and a way to actually, you know, check on whether or not those things are happening in the time frame that we expected them to happen. It sounds yeah. basic, but the amount of times that I see that that doesn't happen, it's it's often. You know, having gone through that process and I guess finding your own way of, of building strategies, do, do you have a recommendation for how many things people are focused on like changing at once or, you know, let's say, you know, it's like decrease time to hire, decrease cost for hire. You know, there's only so many things you can maybe do a great job at. Um, do you have any kind of framework like that or recommendations? I think you. If, uh, th that's the other thing. That's like the, we signed up for too much stuff, right? So yeah, do you want to get, yeah. do you want to get three things? Do you want to get three things done really, really well and knock them out of the park or get like none of 15 things that you signed up for? I mean, I don't think it's about the number of things. It's about um, going back to the discussion we were having earlier around what is the organizational capacity to be able to take on what it is that we might want to deliver so that you had to look through mm -hmm. that lens and the timing of that. You have to look at the actual capacity that it's going to take from a resource perspective to do those things. And so you've got, you can't just sign up for the things you, you got to look at what it is, the thing that we want to do. Then you have to, you know, go through like, what's the level of effort? What's the cost? And those are some of the trade-off decisions that one would have to make. And I, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm the leader of my function, but I'm bringing my team together to come up with what we think those priorities are across the portfolio. And then we have to roll up our sleeves and have discussions around why is that is a priority? Like, what do we think that's going to like, what do we think that the business impact would that would be deliver? There's constant, there's a series of trade-offs that we have to make as business leaders all the time. Um, so you have to, you know, we, why why one project and not another um and yeah. so i i it's a matter of like making sure that it's not too much and if we feel that it is too much you have to give yourself space and that sort of operational routine like i'm a huge fan of you know you have to kind of establish a framework for like meetings like there's a lot of meetings right but i feel pretty <laughs> passionately about like if I'm going to be meeting with my team, like what do I do at my staff meetings? What am I doing at managers meetings? And what am I doing at other meetings when we're going to be doing this sort of like, hey, how are we doing? Like operational yeah. meetings and establishing and being really clear about what they are, when you're going to have them and the cadence of them um, sets it up to having an actual routine and an expectation. But if there's like, you know, if you sign up for if something else also, also flies in, like there's always some crisis to show <laughs> that seems to be happening. You know, do you always reserve bandwidth, bandwidth for crisis du jour out of your organization? Or it's the, um, the never-ending cycle of, I just added three more things to the list, but I didn't take something else off. So it's yeah. this constant balance of what are we prioritizing and being laser-focused on those things. 
and then being willing to let go of some of the things you wanted to do to begin with and collectively doing that because I've also seen that, which is like, we just signed up for 10 more things, but we didn't take anything off of our plate. That's just setting us up to everybody up to fail and be burnt out. Absolutely. I was actually talking to um, one of my leaders and and she was saying how, same thing, she she just agreed to a bunch of stuff, but then I hadn't taken anything off. And one of the realizations is in such a fast growing business, you need to set yourself some buffer time. You know, 10% of your week should be left free for this stuff that comes in ad hoc out of the blue. Um, you know, that's really important. Um, do, do you think that this shift to remote work has made executing on strategies and, you know, really driving stuff forwards more difficult or is it just a different approach? I mean, I think the way in which we work and maybe the tools and how we collaborate might have changed a bit. Yeah. But I have to say my personal experience, which hasn't been a hundred percent in pandemic in this current organization, it's been mixed between a previous and this organization. Like I've had experiences where I have onboarded new senior leaders to my team completely virtual and never met them and it didn't impact mm. how it is that we got things done. Mm. That's great. I so guess it- I think yeah, I guess it all goes back to what you were saying before, that clear that clear guide of what everyone's responsible for, ownership. Um, and that's the same whether you're in person or not, right? That's normally what creates a lot of the friction and things not getting done and getting dropped between cracks. Um, maybe less about being actually in person. Um, I, awesome. I, that's, been my, that's been my experience. I think the other thing too that I, that I thought of in one of the questions that you asked, I, I also feel that sometimes... We in TA feel like because the business is somewhat, and this is controversial, I don't know that I actually see them as customers. I see our candidates as customers. I see the client as a strategic stakeholder and partner for how it is that we work together to create a great experience for that candidate and put us in a position where we're actually having the information we need to make good selection of the talent that we're hiring. And I think there's this, this, you know, age old behavior, which is, oh, the well, if my hiring manager is happy and the business is happy, that it's good. Well, it could be like the business is happy, but we're doing a bunch of stuff that's like foolish and yeah. wasting our time and things that we shouldn't be doing. I think we have to put ourselves in a situation where, you know, we are the subject matter experts that we are you know, helping to build an architect, the solutions and that we're prescribing the process versus being order takers. Mm -hmm. And that, that we as leaders can be in the room and, you know, we don't always have to say yes. I I think it's, you know, we have to push back on the time or I have, you know, I have, especially in the environment that I'm in, hiring managers always want different cuts of data or like, I'd really love to be able to see these trends data. There's always a, like, there's a, like no lack of an appetite for data from our, from our hiring teams. You just have to like, sometimes it's like, well, you know, it's the, the adage that I use is like, you have a sham, you, you want champagne, but like I am in a beer budget. Like yeah. you want the, the Ferrari and I've got a Pinto, like, but <laughs> you can explain to them. You can explain to them, this is the journey. Like I aspire to get to X, Y, Z, but in the current state, here's our blockers. And this is what I'm able to do. I think there's so much that we just feel compelled to say that we have to do it. And yes. So it's a little bit of like pushing back and setting expectations so that you're not constantly in this reacting, getting like asked all the time for all these different things du jour, which is, I think makes our, our business that we run frenetic. And that's, that is like a consistent theme and thread that I see across multiple TA organizations that I've either is exposed to or have worked with is this mm-hmm. constant like like asking either the managers or the recruiters for things that aren't ready that then they're like it's fire drilling. I call it, you know, you know, doing gymnastics to try to get to one place to the next and how is it that we actually stop that so that we can go on and have a regular business that we're running and educate them and bring them along in the journey of like, this is where we are. I might be totally, 
it's okay to say where we are if it's somewhat broken. But at least I know it's somewhat broken or that we have these areas of opportunity, but that we're you know, aspiring to get to X, Y, Z by when. But I think it's super important to set that across all levels, whether it's at you know, the VP and the exec level or the next levels down so that you don't get yourself into this constant, you know, I'm on my heels reacting um, to the multiple, you know, random requests du jour. I agree with you about you know, this frenetic kind of pace that happens in, in recruiting functions. And I've wondered why that is. Do you think it's because a lot of what recruiting teams do is hidden? Um, and a lot of the work that we do, and, and maybe, you know, I, th- I still get surprised at how little hiring managers know about what happens behind the scenes in recruiting um, and how we actually get that candidate to turn up to an interview and, you know, get an offer and what, what happens all all behind the scenes. Um, do you think that that's why there's just not enough, enough visibility? So there's this idea that there's lots of time and, and people have a lot of bandwidth. Or what, what do you think the reason is? Yeah, I think in so many cases, it starts with, it's the dynamic of the business climate. It's the dynamic and the maturity of the businesses that we support. I, you know, headcount planning, workforce planning, the ability for us to have an enterprise strategy where it's thoughtful and proactive and planful um, is challenging. Mm-hmm. Like half the time we end up responding to the businesses reorging, they're changing their priorities. And so a lot of times we are on our heels responding and reacting to that. So I, I, I do think there's an element of a lack of overall maturity in general around um, maturity and workforce planning practices. Mm-hmm. Um, and having a line of sight of like, what is it that we think we're going to be hiring. But think, and you also think about this, what we've been experiencing in the last 24 months plus the, the great reshuffle, resignation, whatever we want to call it, you know, from a staffing perspective, where our team is resourced based off assumptions of X percent of attrition rates. And depending mm-hmm. on how large of a business that is that you're supporting a 10 to 20% jump, like a 10% jump on a base of, like a 20,000 person head count, like 10% of yeah. 20,000, <laughs> a lot of more heads <laughs> that you need to hire that you're certainly not staffed to do. So I think there's some, I think that there's an element there. Um, but I, I, I find that, um, you know, whether or not like you, the TA is always like you, TA functions are always in some sort of bit of maturity, which is how established are your processes is tech enabled to to deliver on those processes? Tooling, sophistication of sourcing models. There's there's so many different variables um, that make up why um, how mature the function is, how complex the function is. Um, but at the end of the day, the hiring managers want to be able to fill their headcount, and if we don't have a lack of sophistication, like we're we're this, it's very very few times where we're actually have a proactive plan that's in front of us that says what we're going to hire that actually remains true for more than a month. It seems, I mean, it's yeah. just we're constantly <laughs> reacting to, to dynamics. Yeah. It's really interesting. And, and I think the value of talent and how it impacts businesses is becoming more and more prevalent. And hopefully with that and with people that are becoming business leaders as well as just TA leaders that can shift this conversation to be, you know, more proactive and, have a seat at the table and make sure the business are thinking about this and it's front of mind. So that's a future that sounds really great. And I could definitely talk to you about this forever. Um, but I'm really conscious of your time. And I wanted to wrap up with, with, with one more question. Um, you know, I think I might know the answer based on what we've been speaking about, but what are you most excited about um, in town acquisition and the future of TA at the moment? I mean, right, you know, right now, I mean, we've been in like this knowledge economy for such a long time, which you've, you've pointed to, like we are in like the, the value of a, of an organization right now in the book says a lot of it is intangible. It's not like the manufacturing days when it was assets. It's like, it's our intellectual property, which is talent. Right. So that puts us in a really interesting place to be and will continue to be. I also think with, like the changing technology landscape, even within our own ability to purchase products and tech in a TA function to help us to really automate. I mean, there's been like hype around the replacement of the recruiter mm-hmm. and how automation is going to somehow negate um, the necessity of our function, which I, I don't believe to be true. 
Um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how we as a function continue to raise our game in the level of sophistication around passive sourcing, around building out real marketing functions for how we connect with like prospective candidates Mm -hmm. and how is it that the, 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 the sort of goal for a TA function is to be like, I have a ready pipeline that when my hiring manager wants X person, that I magically have this qualified, amazing person. And, you know, we, we're not there yet, but I think through, you know, the ability to leverage technology and to uh, the ability to build, you know, data warehouse lakes of, you know, talent, that's our prospective talent and getting to know who we want to hire in the future and becoming more of a, think about what a marketing function does for a sales function. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they know everything. Think about what they know about their customer and their prospective customers Mm -hmm. a lot. We need to get to the place where we know as much about our, you know, company's prospective customers as we do about our talent. And I think, if we can translate that and and operate like that, it would be a game changer. And yeah, we need to have the workforce strategy and the workforce planning stuff and whatnot. But for us to really understand the talent that's out there, how to engage with them earlier on and actually build ready pipelines, it's it's there. We just need to execute on how we design an organization to support something like that and leverage the technology that's continuing to be advanced in that space for us to be able to do it. So that coupled with, you know, all the supply side data and talent intelligence and market intelligence is a really powerful asset. So I'm 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 interested in seeing where that goes um, and continues to mature in our space. Awesome. I'm inspired. I need to go and do some recruiting now. So um, uh, thanks a lot, Kelly. It's been really great to chat to you. Um, and I'm sure the listeners will. Thanks for having me. Thank you.